Hello, I'm Secretary of State Kim Wyman from Washington State, and I want to uh, first say thank you for inviting me to be part of DEF CON 2020 and uh, share a little bit about Washington's experience with vote by mail and the challenges that we have with election security and how we've tried to overcome them and how we're preparing for the upcoming August primary and uh, November general elections here in Washington State. Uh, so I'm going to real quick share my uh, share my screen and uh, walk you through kind of what uh, what Washington State has done to prepare for the 2020 election cycle and how we are dealing with all of the things that are coming at us in 2020. So first and foremost, I'm pretty certain each one of you has uh, been very aware of Russians trying to hack into the election system in the 2016 elections. And I've been uh, an election official for many years and have watched this kind of progression that we've had in the election community for election security. And in the 1990s, we instituted cutting edge technology like uh, using the driver's license information to register voters and put election night results online. And from that moment to today, election security has been something we've been aware of and have worked really hard to, uh, to try to make sure our systems are secure. And I think Right up until 2016, most election officials felt pretty good about the level of security that we had in, in our industry. Um, and uh, today what I want to do is share with you kind of what a Washington state's election system looks like, how we inspire public confidence in our process, and what our kind of triad of election security is, and then talk a little bit about the impacts of COVID-19 on uh, our election system and quite frankly, the nation's election system. So I, I got into election administration in the 1990s, early 1990s, and I can tell you when I started in this field, my goal was to become an elections expert, to learn and understand how the election process works and to be able to uh, conduct elections in a, in a secure and, uh, and accessible manner. And then the 2000s, that evolved because suddenly the demands on our system were so great that we had to rely on technology to be able to produce uh, election results quickly and to serve our voters well by providing a lot of information on the um, internet. So we now suddenly not only had to become an elections expert, but also had to be an IT expert and understand at least how systems worked and how to use technology in a way to help us oversee our, our election systems. <laughs> and about the time I started feeling like I knew what I was doing and the IT world, and, and I say that because I, I'm just dangerous enough to, to know how to use technology, but certainly not to any of the levels that uh, any of you are. But by 2016, it became very apparent that not only did we need to be election experts and understand IT systems, but we needed to know how to secure them. And cybersecurity for the last four years has certainly been front and center in election administration. So let me start kind of with the, the basics of why I think uh, the United States election system is very um, secure just because of um, the decentralized nature of it. So when people think of elections, I think oftentimes they think of the national, that there's some sort of national election administration, when in fact, it's a really decentralized network made up of 10,000 election officials nationwide who like me are either appointed or um, are elected to office they take an oath to uphold the Constitution and the Constitution and laws in their state. And I think the overall strength of this system is that no single person or group has total control of the overall operation. <clears throat> Whoa. And so when you, you get down to election systems in each individual state, and I, I bear with me here, I'm having, having a challenge operating my own PowerPoint system. Um, you have the same similar threads. We have a decentralized system here in Washington and each state is gonna be different and unique. Uh, and Washington is certainly uh, one of five vote by mail states, but I think you can look at the, the individual um, makeup of each state and know that this decentralization is actually happening within the states as well. So here in Washington, we have the Secretary of State, myself, 
Uh, my office is the um, overseer of elections in Washington, and I'm the chief election officer. I have the rulemaking authority to put into um, put into effect rules that adapt our laws that our legislature passes. So uh, this is how counties implement the day to day operations on the ground. Uh, we manage a statewide voter registration database and oversee the election uh, in initiative and referendum process, as well as do election night reporting. Uh, we do voter outreach and education, and we certify and train our election officials, as well as the election tabulation systems that are used in each of our 39 counties. Our system is decentralized in that 39 county election officials are the chief election officials in their county, and they are elected. They oversee the voter registration processing and the management of elections in their county. So they're the ones who are actually issuing ballots and uh, operating the tabulation systems and uh, any kind of other tech like uh, ballot sorting equipment or the actual facilities that process ballots. Um, they also provide voter outreach and education to their voters and manage all of that information, usually through social media and their web pages. Now, I imagine most of you are, uh, are aware that in 2016, the federal government uh, designated elections as critical infrastructure. And this is significant because it put us on the same national security level as the power grid or the banking system. And so um, what it has done in, in our state, it is, is really helped us reinforce what I like to think of as our triad of security for Washington and, and our vote by mail system. Um, I forgot to mention that earlier. In 2011, Washington state became a vote by mail state. And um, at that point, every single one of our counties had, it, had to conduct elections entirely by mail and mail out a ballot to each of their voters. So um, this process didn't happen overnight. We really started back in the 1990s in, uh, in allowing any voter to be a permanent absentee voter, which meant they received a ballot every election. And that evolved to the early 2000s when uh, we had the closest governor's race in the country's history. And following that and following a lot of things that went wrong, both at the polling place and uh, in the absentee balloting, uh, we determined that we couldn't do both elections well and the legislature allowed counties to move to vote by mail voluntarily. Uh, in 2005, Many of the counties in the state did move to vote by mail, but it still took our state five years to completely become a vote by mail state. And that's because it took time to get the equipment and facilities to uh, really provide for processes and procedures that we could conduct elections well. So, which is what leads us to the triad of security for Washington vote by mail elections. So there's three real pieces to this, uh, this election model. It's the physical security, the logical security, things you would just do innately, and the digital security that we provide. So let me start by just talking through kind of the, the physical security elements that are inherent in a vote by mail election. First and foremost, I think the strength is that we are we rely on paper ballots. Even the, the ballots that are issued in a vote center and voters use to uh, use a, an assistive device to vote them, all of those ballots are paper ballots that um, are printed by those machines uh, that the voter actually does mark and are, are processed. So we can always go back to those paper ballots and do a risk limiting audit or a, a full recount if we need to, to really inspire that confidence that voters uh, need to have in the, the election results. Uh, we have ballot drop boxes here in Washington state, in addition to the, the blue mailboxes provided by the USPS. Uh, these ballot drop boxes are throughout the state and they're managed by our county election officials. They, we have about 470 of them statewide and uh, they open at the beginning of the voting period, which is 20 days before election day. Anytime they are emptied, they are emptied by two employees of the uh, county. And I know that sometimes they try to have that be a, a Democrat and a Republican when, when possible, but they are staffed by, they are, they are staff that are employed by the county and take an oath to uphold the laws and the, the procedures and policies 
policies for the county. So they are held accountable for that processing. They uh, seal, they lock and seal those boxes, and they do that with individual numbers, numbered seals that are actually logged and kept track of too. So pretty much all of the steps I'm going to talk about are what we use to build an, an electronic and physical audit trail that we have in place in case we ever get into a recount or a situation where anyone is calling into question our processes, we can go back and show which employees had access to which ballots at any given time. Uh, and we have dual control environments throughout this. So it's, uh, it's just really important that those audit logs and dual controls are in place to inspire confidence again. Um, this is true throughout all of our election processing facilities as well. Uh, we have secured storage for ballots and ballot materials that uh, involve physical locks. In some of our counties, it may be key card access. Uh, servers, for the server room, for example, for ballot tabulation equipment is in a secured uh, room and has very limited access and again is log or key card controlled. So we have a record of anyone who has access to it. And then uh, we have security systems and key card access throughout these facilities as well to just have that physical layer of security on top of any cybersecurity elements that we have in place. Uh, the second, I guess, group of, of security measures are those sort of logical ones, things that uh, just make sense. Uh, of course, the first one would be that our tabulation systems aren't connected to the Internet. And I know this is something that came under fire in the last few years nationally, but uh, our, our county election officials have made sure that their tabulation systems not only are air-gapped, from the internet in every way, but there's no modems operating or even installed in those systems and that any connection that needs to be made with the vendor or with, uh, with election officials is done on site in that air gapped environment. Um, we, we have a real love of transparency in elections and certainly that is true in any processing facilities or courthouses across our state that uh, all of the activities are observable. Um, we, we like it when it's bipartisan, when we have Democrats and Republicans overseeing that process. Uh, we actually ask the um, local county parties to appoint observers to come in and represent e each of the parties. Um, if that can't happen, and of course in the COVID-19 environment, that's becoming a, a, a bit of a problem for um, just space reasons, our county Courthouses oftentimes do not have a lot of extra space in the smaller counties, so uh, a lot of counties have used their security money to install cameras that uh, run 24-7 during the voting period, during that entire 20 days, and then the 20 days or so after when we're certifying the election, so that people can watch it uh, online from the safety and comfort of their home, but, uh, but also have that transparency so you can show that we're not we're not trying to hide anything or do anything uh, kind of under the table. Um, ballot reconciliation is a really important part as well. Um, this would be, you know, counting the number of ballots that are received each day in the mail and then through the process reconciling them and being able to show whether a ballot was counted that was issued to a voter or not and if it wasn't counted why it wasn't and the only people that can reject a ballot are our bipartisan canvassing boards. Uh, we also have um, election night reporting and we have fail safe measures and, and checks and balances that my CISO told me to, to say is out of band communication verification. And what we do on election night is uh, counties are uploading their results to our uh, state uh, election night reporting system and we compile those results for um, offices that go across county lines and we take that initial file that they send us and then we verify it by a fax or an email that is sent by the county as well separately to just make sure that the information that we're putting up online is accurate and is the way that the county's uh, reported it in the first place. So all of these systems, you know, this logical <laughs> element of our uh, election security is really just trying to, to create that, that sense of, of transparency and provide a lot of checks and balances, both physical and electronic, that make sense and um, are easy to explain to the average voter so that they can understand what it is we're doing. 
of course, the final leg of that uh, that tri that uh, stool would be the digital security. And um, for us, we we really started working on this probably five ten years ago it, by modernizing our election system. And now we have a highly segmented network system uh, that employs multi-factor authentication for all of our users. We have um, really tried to to increase and expand our user training and um, outreach to just make them aware of cybersecurity issues and the things that they need to do to make sure our overall system is secure. And we've done robust testing and that happens on an ongoing basis. And as, as all of you are aware, you know, it's, it's a constant battle to stay ahead of of hackers and, and people trying to get into our system. So I think just that user awareness has uh, increased in the last four years on a, a level and a scale that we just weren't doing before 2016. Uh, we're currently part of the National Sensor Network, and this is not only the state system, but counties across the state are, are part of it as well. And we, we built and have created a dedicated um, election security operation center that is in my office, but it also supports the 39 county election offices because what we found is that many of the smaller and medium-sized counties are lucky if they have an IT professional for their entire county, let alone in their, their elections division and let alone a, a cyber security expert. So um, this partnership has also helped us have good communication and training with those election officials and do assessments in their counties that help them strengthen their system as well. Um, we also played an active role in the critical infrastructure build out of the election sector. So. Um, these are all kind of the, the key parts of, of our system. And I think that critical infrastructure designation also allowed us to create partnerships with our own uh, state uh, CISO and CIO, but also our Washington National Guard, who is a very strong cybersecurity team. And they've come in and done assessments and monitor our system and, and give us feedback and ways to uh, improve our system. They've also helped us do tabletop exercises and trainings for our users, which again, just continues to raise the awareness level and preparedness level, level of our election officials. Uh, we've worked with them also to build out our continuity of operation plans, which have obviously a digital component to in the security of our system, but also how are we going to uh, not only detect and, and defend our system or protect and defend our system, but how are we going to detect an intrusion and recover and respond in case that uh, does happen. Um, we've also worked with the state auditor's office, Department of Homeland Security and the FBI uh, with similar threads to those um, activities. So we've been focusing on all of this for the last four years pretty uh, intently. And as if that wasn't enough, uh, in early in the early part of this year, we had to throw in a global pandemic because, you know, why not? Um, so Washington uh, was in the middle of our presidential primary when COVID-19 began to spike and we started having the first deaths in the country, actually, for COVID-19. And um, it did affect and impact our March 10th presidential primary. We were on track to have turnout of about 60%. And the weekend right before election day was when COVID really started spiking and the governor started to issue stay at home orders. So we ended up with a turnout of 49%. And I think we're running about the third highest in the country for presidential primary turnout. And a lot of that has to do with vote by mail because our, our voters were still able to drop ballots off and didn't have to go into a polling place or a vote center on election day. Um, we've seen, of course, across the country, presidential primaries canceled or postponed. There has been uh, incredible interest nationally on vote by mail, and I've given uh, many, many uh, talks and been on panels and, and talked to media about uh, our experience here in, in Washington. And um, what I can tell you is that, that our state is, uh, well, we're implementing a pr uh, primary right now. Our regular primary is on August 4th, so we'll be in the middle of, uh, of the, the uh, we're right in the middle of processing ballots for that election and certifying it. And of course, we're gearing up for the general election. And my colleagues across the country are doing the same uh, in their states, trying to expand absentee voting or vote by mail as best they can because Congress hasn't allocated money. And as if that wasn't enough, you know, the USPS is in financial distress and uh, Congress has just allocated an additional $10 billion 
of potential loans. So we're hoping that they uh, they remain stable between now and November. I think they're going to, but uh, the uh, USPS is a critical element for elections this year across the country because so many election uh, offices are expanding um, voting by mail. Uh, to give you kind of perspective of how significant this is, um, if you look at this map, the states in blue are the states that at the end of 2019 were already vote by mail, including Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, and Hawaii. Um, as you can see, as you move east in the country, fewer and fewer states either are vote by mail or even have access to absentee voting. And so um, the grayer or the wider the states as you move east, uh, those are going to be the states that have the hardest time moving to expanded absentee usage and vote by mail because they don't have the systems in place, high-speed ballot sorters, um, envelope openers, even just the physical space to socially distance and process those ballots as efficiently as we can here in Washington or the other four states that do vote by mail elections. So um, we're, we're trying to help those states gear up and they're working very hard to expand that capacity and capability. And I think you're gonna see a hybrid model across the country, including my state here in Washington, of um, voting at home and voting um, in person, because even here in Washington, one to two percent of our voters will vote in person. So, so it, it's going to be a, a, a heavy lift, but election officials are working hard to make sure it's going to happen. And in that environment, of course, we introduce the politics, and uh, it's bipartisan. I like to talk about these things in terms of bipartisanship, but we have. Republicans on on the right, uh, certainly the president and and Senator McConnell and some of their associates who are concerned about voter fraud. And on the left, we have uh, members of Congress uh, like Senator Wyden and Senator Klobuchar who are really trying to expand vote by mail access and uh, voting at home. And uh, and unfortunately, out of the White House and Department of Justice, we're hearing about uh, voter fraud on a level that is implying and and. He's point blank said that uh, there's going to be uh, rampant fraud and uh, vote rigging. And, you know, this is the environment that election officials are operating in and trying to inspire confidence in. And so I say that because um, we're seeing success stories already in, in the primaries that have been held in the last month or so. I think Kentucky is a great example of um, the innovation that, that election officials are trying to bring to the COVID environment and make voting a safe experience for not to vote in person or at home. Um, so you can see in these pictures, um, these are things that happened on election day in Kentucky. Uh, they had a, a huge shortage, as we are seeing across the country, of election workers because many of our election workers are senior citizens who are the highest risk for, for COVID 19. So they adapted by just making these mega polling centers, and uh, I think this was right in their. Uh, uh, right in Nashville, excuse me, not Nashville, right in Lexington, uh, I believe it's where these pictures are from, uh, where they made massive uh, vote centers where people could come and socially distance and receive their ballots, and uh, they were able to process those ballots well. Um, the other thing, of course, is, as I was talking about, is election officials in our state have uh, ballot boxes throughout the state that are secure, that are, uh, that are serviced daily by, by a pickup or the uh, USPS mailboxes. So, um, you know, what we're really trying to do, I think, here in Washington, I know we're doing here in Washington State, and I think what we're trying to do across the country is provide voters options and make sure that those are secure options that they can believe in and, uh, and try to inspire confidence in, uh, in the elections. And so I'll leave you with the, the biggest thing that I'm concerned with, with all of the arts and chatter about uh, voter suppression if we don't have universal vote by mail or voter fraud if we don't have complete poll site voting um, is uh, really dealing with the misinformation and disinformation that are out there, um, not only from, from the president or, or from members of Congress or whoever, but uh, you know, from foreign actors like Russia. Uh, we have a national movement, or a national movement, national hashtag uh, Trusted Info 2020. And what we're really trying to do is drive um, voters to trusted sources like 
secretaries of state offices or county election departments or uh, local election departments that uh, are going to provide info that you can believe in and, and know is true. And, uh, you know, different jurisdictions have different other hashtags and taglines like ours is the vote starts with you and really trying to empower voters to um, to, to know where to go to get information on social media and uh, um, online. So uh, that is my and I hope that uh, that, uh, that, that uh, gives you a good overview of some of the security measures and, and practices we've implemented here in Washington State. I'm sorry that uh, we can't be together in person, but I, I guess I want to leave you all with uh, a word of thanks uh, for all of the work that you're doing to try to help find the vulnerabilities in election cybersecurity and giving us feedback so we can make the system better. I, I think it, as I look back a few years ago to, uh, to a few early DEFCON voting villages uh, where, you know, you, you all pointed out some pretty hard truths. And I think that it was, it was difficult for election officials like myself to hear and our, our knee-jerk reaction was to push back and say we're wrong. And what I love about DEFCON now and what I understand more is that uh, we need to work together and, and we need to uh, help us find those, those vulnerabilities and give us tips on how we can better secure our election system because at the end of all of this, no matter where we are on the political spectrum, no matter what job we have in this process, we need to inspire confidence in the public that our elections are accessible and secure and that the election results are fair and accurate. And we look forward to working with you in the future. I hope in 2021 that uh, you'll invite me back to, uh, to DEF CON and we can have these conversations in person. But uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, at the uh, Secretary of State's office and uh, here in Washington. Uh, my email address, because this is so old-fashioned probably to this group is kim.wyman, that's K-I-M dot W-Y-M-A-N, M-A-N at S-O-S dot W-A dot G-O-V. So thank you so much for giving me time at the conference. I hope you have a great conference remotely and we hopefully can be all together uh, next year. So take care.